As Deborah said, I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. I'm a commercial photographer based here in New York. Uh, and I've been shooting with Sony since 2011. Also, just so you know, I'm also a Manfrotto ambassador in X-Rite Colorado, and I'm the APA national president. And today I'm going to be talking about creating portraits with the Sony Alpha A7R III, which is this camera here. As Deborah mentioned, it was just announced late October. It's been available since late November. It is my favorite camera that exists in the world. Um, it is. I was just at CES last week up on the Sony stage talking about it every day for a couple hours. and. So some of this I'm really used to saying. Uh, it's a great, great camera. And when the blackout happened at CES for the first time ever for two hours, it was a great camera to wander around in the dark and take pictures with. Although it took me an hour to realize, you know, I should be wandering around taking pictures in the dark with this. All right, so we're going to start with talking about some of the features of this camera that are new and different compared to other Sony cameras, and in particular different compared to the a7R II. And then we'll start getting into uh, a little bit of a demonstration of some of the features on the camera, and then we'll get into shooting some portraits. We have Daniel and Chelsea in the audience are going to be our wonderful models today. Um, are, are you on Instagram, Daniel? Yeah, I am. And Chelsea, are you on Instagram? All right, well, we'll give you Daniel's Instagram when he comes up so that you can all follow him. So among the features that have been improved on this are the eye autofocus. The eye autofocus, I'll demonstrate this in a minute, looks for an eye in the frame, finds that nearest eye, and focuses on the eye. So if you're shooting with a really shallow depth of field, like your 2.8, 1.8, 1.4, Instead of getting the nose sharp and the eyes out of focus or the ears sharp and the eyes out of focus, you can hit the eye. And if you're on continuous, it will track. So if somebody turns around, it loses the eye because the back of the head is there, picks it up again. They're running around the frame. It's, it's quite magical. The R2 has it as well. Several other Sony cameras do. But it's really amazing what it can do now. 399 focal plane. Uh, phase detect focal plane autofocus points. F phase detect is what allows a camera to focus on something that's moving or what you're using in video. Because there's so many, it covers the bulk of the frame. Cameras in the past traditionally have clustered the autofocus points in the center of the frame. Because there's so many and they're so spread out, you can focus much closer to, to the edges. So if you're composing off center, you, can, you don't have to do the focus and recompose. How many of you have done focus and recompose a million times? Me too. I got really good at it. Center point, recompose. Center point, recompose. That's great, except it takes time, and I don't want to spend time when I could otherwise be shooting. I'd rather just shoot. Uh, there's also a joystick. They call it something else, but I don't remember what it's called. There's a joystick to move focus points, if you like that. I'll demonstrate that. They improved the battery. So the, this and the A9 have the Z battery which is over twice the life of the previous W battery. I've gotten well over 2,000 frames on a single battery. Yes? Do they have a purpose so you can have two batteries instead of one? You know that's going to be so we do have a question, which is, does it, is there a grip that you can put two batteries in? Yes, there is a grip that you can put two batteries in. And, it, and I believe it's available now. I like the small size. I put a lot of stuff in my rolling bag when I travel. so. I started out with a grip on my cameras and then I stopped using it because I have two bodies and nine lenses in my bag. So I wanted all the space I could get. The buffer has been improved. I can get a little over 70 comp compressed raw frames in a burst. To be fair, the only times I will ever shoot 70 frames in a row is when I'm showing people I can shoot 70 frames in a row. Other than that, I, I'm just not going to shoot that many. Because it, it'll do 10 frames a second in both mechanical and electronic shutter. So 70 frames in seven seconds, that's a lot of pictures. More than I need, typically, and I shoot a lot. Uh, there's dual card slots. There's a UHS-2 card slot, which is a faster standard. So if you're shooting with a UHS-2 card, I use the Sony G cards, uh, it will write much faster. So if you do fill that buffer, it will clear a lot faster. The second slot is UHS-1, so it's not as fast, but it will allow you to shoot to both slots at once, or RAW to one, JPEG to the other, or to slot one and then slot two in sequence. 
whatever makes sense for you. It has UH USB-C port and a micro USB. Micro USB is what Sony's had forever. Uh, USB-C is much, much faster. But by having both, you can still use accessories that you might have had previously and shoot tethered at the same time. You can power the camera with uh, like the battery bank that you might use for your phone through the micro USB and still shoot tethered. Like I mentioned, 10 frames a second, both mechanical and electronic shutter. So mechanical allows you to shoot with strobes. Electronic is silent. So if you're anywhere where noise is an issue, like let's say every one of you were trying to photograph me now for some bizarre reason. Um, if there were you know, 25, 30 cameras firing, that would be distracting. But if you were all shooting with silent shutter, it wouldn't matter. If you're on a movie set, it doesn't matter. If you're at a concert, it doesn't matter. If your children or pets are skittish and jump when there's noise, you can sneak up on them and take their picture. Uh, it also has slow and quick in video. How many people here shoot video? Anybody? Three. For the three of you, it's cool. For the rest of you, if you ever shoot video, it'll be cool. Slow and quick allows for slower and faster frame rates. So you can shoot as low as one frame a second in video to get that very, very fast sort of time lapse feel. It'll do one, two, four, eight, I think 15, and then 24, and then up to 120. It won't do 120 in full, eight, in full 4K, it'll do it in HD. Um, and another thing that a lot of people I knew wanted was it can write to a card and a computer simultaneously if you're shooting tethered. It is a little slower than just shooting tethered, but it will write to both the card and the computer at the same time. All right, that was a mouthful, right? So I thought I'd talk a little bit about finding portrait subjects because I get asked that a lot. How do you find people to photograph? I've only had this camera a month and a half, so I've shot, I don't know, 10, 12 shoots with it, some of which were jobs, so I couldn't show those. But finding portrait subjects. Clients, that's the best way. I love it when clients find the portrait subject for you. Here, go here, shoot these people, make something great. That's the best thing ever. You get access you wouldn't otherwise get. You get to go places you wouldn't otherwise get to go. You get to go behind that door that says no admittance. Because I'm speaking up here, I get to go behind that door there that you're not allowed to go behind. It's great. It's one of the best things about photography. You get to go those places that other people don't go. Sometimes it's boring on the other side, but it's still cool. Of course, we all have friends, I hope. If you don't have friends, make some. People are friendly. Um, and that's how I started shooting portraits, is just asking people I knew. Strangers on the street. So I know one person here is traveling. Uh, strangers on the street can be a good one, but I find it challenging. What I have learned with portraits is if you go up to someone on the street and you want to take their picture, there has to be a reason. In April of last year, every day of the month, I decided to photograph one stranger. And I only had one person turn me down. It was because I couldn't explain well why I was doing it. I went up to somebody on a newsstand in the subway and I said, can I take your picture? And he said, why? And I said, because I'm taking a picture of somebody every day for the month. And he's like, no. That, w that wasn't a compelling reason. But after that, I started picking out something about that person. So if you see somebody interesting, what is it about them that makes you want to photograph them? So there was a guy who had giant rings. I'm like, those rings are awesome. Can I take a picture? Yes. Somebody was wearing a shirt that was matching the wall he was in front of. I'm like, can I take your picture? He's like, sure. There was a woman dressed all in pink at Lincoln Center. I'm like, that pink is awesome, can I take your picture? She looked at me a little funny and then said, sure. So don't be afraid to go up to people, just think about why you are. What it is that's gonna make it a reason for them to say yes, make it easy for them to say yes. If it's something about them that's not specifically about them, like your hair is awesome, might do it. What they're wearing, where they are. For me, that made it a lot easier. And Except for the one person on the first day, every other day everybody said yes. How many people like to walk up to strangers and ask to take their pictures? All right, one, good, I hate it. That's why I did it for a month. I absolutely hate it, but it worked. Uh, 
some of the resources I use are, there's a lot of sites online for casting. I use a website called Casting Network. I'm not affiliated with any of these, by the way. I use Casting Network a lot. Um, there's also Actors Access, Backstage, other sites like that. Uh, what I've found is they can be very, very useful, but you have to be specific. So just saying I'm looking for people to photograph, not specific enough. I'm looking for people to photograph and this is why and this is when starts being more. I think with all of these sites, at least the good ones, if you are not clear enough in your casting, they won't post it and they'll bounce it back to you. So if you just say people to photograph on Tuesday, they'll say be more specific. And then you be more specific. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you're willing to pay a little bit of money, even a little, it helps. I'll, I usually have no trouble getting people just in trade for pictures. But if it's something where I think I'm going to make any money potentially, then I will pay them something. Even if I don't know, I'll make you know 50 bucks, something. Something nominal, but that acknowledges that they're putting something into it too. Uh, Actors Access, I think, won't let you cast post to casting at all unless it's at least 150. Uh, but Casting Network is free to post. Actors Access is free to post. Backstage, I think you pay $20 or something to post. Uh, you can go to model agencies. If you feel like you have strong work already, every model agency has models that, they, that you can test with. So you, you call them up or you email them. They will probably ask for a website. In the old days when I started, long, I've been doing this 20 years since I started assisting. So back in the day, early 2000s, feels like a long time ago now, you'd go in with your portfolio. But now they'll ask for a website. And they'll look at your work and if they feel like it fits, then you can call them up and say, I'm looking to test on Saturday. And they'll say, OK, here's four people who are available. Who do you want? So it's worth doing, but you do need a certain level of work to start with. Make sense? All right. And then personal projects. This is one of my favorite ways, but also the, one of the more complicated ways, is if you can come up with some sort of project that gives you a reason to photograph people. For about a year, I had a project that I called the Interesting People Project. And I would ask everybody I knew to suggest people they thought were interesting. They'd write it down, make an introduction to that person. I'd photograph that person. And I'd put it on a blog I had, someinterestingpeople.com. So I wasn't even selecting the people. If Daniel was like my cousin Bob, it's super cool, and this is why, great. I just did a project for a magazine that I pitched to the magazine that was women mayors in the Northeast. It took me two years to figure out how to get access, and then I felt like an idiot, because the answer is find a client who will let you do it. But if you have a project that, sort of like the strangers on the street, if you have a project, it allows people to understand this is why I'm being photographed. And if it's something they're passionate about, they're usually interested in it. I have a friend who did women rugby players. You know, anything that you find interesting in the world, and there's a lot of interesting things in the world, find the people that are interested in that and make a project out of that. And that allows you to take really compelling portraits in an interesting way. Make sense? Just a quick question, if I may. On these pictures, are you talking about studio shoots or on location? OK. So the question is, am I talking about studio or location portraits? Either way, it doesn't matter. For me personally, I prefer location because I like to go to new places and see new things. Um, but that's not always an option. And when I'm doing just castings, weather's an issue. Getting access to locations can be an issue. So I will sometimes just rent a cheap studio space and shoot there if it's for myself. There is a site I just learned about called Peerspace. I haven't used them yet. That seems like it's sort of an Airbnb for locations. And I do plan on trying to use that. In New York City, getting access to locations is a challenge. You know, you're, if you're in your hometown of wherever, let's say your hometown has 50,000 people, and there's a diner you go to, 
and they know you, you can probably ask them and they'll probably say, sure, come in when it's slow, take some pictures. If you go into a diner in New York City, maybe they'll say yes, but I think more often they'll, they will be reluctant. Sometimes you can get that access. So finding that location access is a challenge. In New York City, you can shoot on the streets. If you use a tripod on the street, you don't need a permit. If you use a light that touches the ground, you need a permit. But if you use that light and you have someone hold it, you don't need a permit. For New York City, public property outdoors. And permits now, it used to be free, and now they're $300. So it's not really. When they were free, I would always get a permit and shoot outside all the time. Now that it's $300, I'd rather pay someone $300 to hold a light and give that money to somebody I know rather than to the city. So in New York, you use a tripod and have it on the ground, not the light. So the question again is, in New York, yes, you can put a tripod on the ground. In New York City, you can't obstruct traffic. So if it's a narrow sidewalk and I put the tripod right here and people can't get by, they'll say you've got to move. But anywhere that you're not obstructing traffic, foot traffic or vehicular traffic, if it's city property, you can put a tripod down without a permit. If you put a light stand down, even though it takes up less space than this, you do need a permit. For, for parks, do you need a permit? Yeah. Parks, parks or city property, same thing. Yeah. It's a, New York City parks need a permit for parks. Yeah. The, well, the so there's some discussion over whether or not you need a permit for a tripod. There are people in the parks that will say you do. I've also seen. It's on the website. I've also seen things where parks got in trouble for saying that. So, so there's some, somebody says it's on the website that you do. I think there may be some ambiguity there. I've definitely seen instances of parks getting in trouble for telling people that they needed a tripod. Uh, I think their concern is it's on the trip. Yeah, so it's a safety concern. So it's the, that's always the case. If you're, First Amendment issue is if you're a safety hazard, it doesn't matter where you are. Right. That's an issue. When that, in summer, I was shooting in the Central Park, and I saw some other people that were being harassed. It didn't bother me, but I was being discreet as any. So somebody just said, if you're discreet, you're, you should be fine. Don't be a safety hazard. If you are a safety hazard, get a permit and get somebody who's going to watch to stop you from being a safety hazard. Just in life. And there are places like New York City subways are not city property. They're state. And you cannot use a tripod in its subway without a permit period. And I'm sure that there it's a safety hazard. Um, all right, so that was a lot on location. I'm just going to run through a couple of portraits I did, uh, talk a little bit about how, uh, how I lit it, and then we'll run over some of the features of the camera and take some pictures. Sound good? So this is, I wrote down everybody's name, this is Janae. All of these people I'm going to show you I found on Casting Network. Um, Janae, I photographed with the 8518. The one on the left is a single light. It's a large softbox, th uh, four foot by five foot. The one on the right is a four foot by five foot softbox, uh, strobe with a bare head and a warm gel as a rim light. This is Robert, big softbox again. On both of these, it's a black background with a gel on the background. That's where that color and that saturation comes from. We may actually try that. Is that a question back there? Yeah. On the previous one with the girl, uh, you mentioned it was a bare head. There's kind of like uh, on the side of her face. Right here. Like rectangle. It looks almost like it's goboed off or something like that. That's her hair, actually. It's, so this is the bare head. And it's just her hair and her ears that's causing that shape. But there was no gobo. I know it feels like it, but it's, I was too lazy to bring a gobo. Uh, so again, black background with a color gel, super cool. Um, one of those things that I learned a long time ago assisting and then forgot about and then started doing again. And, I have friends who've been shooting longer than me, and they're like, whoa, how'd you do that? So no matter how long you've been shooting, there's new things to learn. There's probably things I could learn from all of you. There's probably things that people watching online are like, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. There's a million ways to do anything. Your way could be better. My way could be better. The way that's best for you is the way that works for you. 
There's no single right answer for anything. Except the only single right answer for everything, anything is that there is no single right answer for anything. The right answer is the tools and the method that work for you and get you the shot you want. Uh, this is Jason. Same thing, green gel in the background, big softbox. This is Stu. Available light in the subway. So at South Ferry, if you're not on a tripod, you're allowed to shoot in the subway. And because this camera, you can crank up the ISO. Uh, we went to South Ferry because the subway stops there and it sits there for five minutes or longer, depending on the time of day. And the cars are empty because everybody just got out. So I photographed him through the window, and then the one on the right is actually the information board that's lit up. That's the light coming on, the, on our left, the right side of his face, is just the existing LED information board, which is also great when you're shooting outside at night. Go to those bus stops with the big, giant ads. Beautiful light. Perfect. Uh, this is Matthias, available light again outside, hard light and soft light. And then Kashena, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but she was very nice. Uh, this was a seven foot, actually seven foot uh, B&H umbrella with a diffusion. And then this is just here real quick before we, now I'm gonna connect up to the camera. If anybody's interested, just so I don't forget to mention it, you can learn more about the cameras and photography in general. Sony has a great site for that, sonyalpha.com. All the artisans, business of photography, techniques, obviously it's Sony heavy because it's Sony, but there is a lot of information there. And their Instagram, sonyalpha.com, or at sonyalpha, I'm at Tony Gale Photo. All right, I'm gonna disconnect and plug into the uh, camera. So what we're gonna start with is just showing you a couple of the features and then we're gonna take some pictures. We tested this to make sure it works. Fingers crossed, look at that. All right, Daniel, can I borrow you? see how bright this is. So to start with, what you're looking at on the screen is that well, I'm right in front of this. Maybe if I step back a little. What you're looking at is the live feed off of my camera. So right now, that's face detect, that green box around Daniel's face. I have face detect turned on. That just looks for a face. We'll typically focus on the nearest one. And then that little green box is eye autofocus. So if you move around a little. So eye autofocus on continuous tracks very well. And if you just turn around, so it, it lost him. All right, come back. And then it picks him up right away. That is one of the changes. So eye autofocus existed on the Sony before. It's magical now, magical. I think there may be some other manufacturers that have it, but no, I don't think anybody in full frame except Sony. It is, that to me is a game changer to be that, to be that accurate. Um, again, we have the USB-C. We have a level. And of course, because these cameras are mirrorless, if I change my exposure, whoops. I can see exactly what I'm gonna get, both in terms of color and exposure. Uh, when you're shooting with strobes, you typically turn that off because the camera may not know you're using strobes. So I have that as a custom button. My C2 button just turns it on and off. We also have in-body image stabilization, not something you wanna use if you're on a tripod, that will allow you to put any lens on here, whether or not it's Sony, and it will be stabilized. So you can get the lens that your grandfather used in World War I. If you can find an adapter, put it on here, it'll still be stabilized. And then, again, because we have that joystick now for focus, I just have a custom button for this. 
and I can move my focus point around. You can see how much of the frame it goes to. Not quite to the edge, but nearly. I'm going to turn it off because I'm going to use eye autofocus because it's magic. All right. Actually, one more thing. Let me just show you how many things you can customize because I think that's really cool. So some people, when they switch systems, don't like menus because they're used to whatever menu they had. I shot something else for 20, uh, 20, 2000, no, 1992 to 2011, however many years that is, 19? 19 years I shot a different system. And it was, then you go to a new system, it's, it can be confusing. If you shoot with Canon, you love Canon. If you shoot with Nikon, you love Nikon. If you shoot with Sony, Sony's the best system. Everybody I know, whatever system they use, that's the menu system they like, and everybody else does it wrong. One of the advantages, does anybody just, I, everybody I know. Um, one of the advantages of this is that you can customize almost any button to do almost anything. So there's, there are 12 buttons that you can customize to be whatever you want. So I have my custom one set for steady shot. I could have it set for silent shooting, steady shot adjust. I'm just going to quickly go through and because it's boring to read 23 pages of options. Um, but you can set it to do almost anything. So whatever menu options you use, there's probably a way to customize it so it's a one button and you don't even have to go into the menu. Make sense? Cool? I think it's cool. Some is the eye focus uh, by default on a particular button? It is. So eye autofocus by default is on the center button here. I have it set to my AF on button because for me that's easier to reach. And my center button here is actually now my focus area button. Is this just on your newest camera? No. It all, uh, maybe I shouldn't say all. Every Sony camera I'm aware of is customizable in this way. The A7R2, the A7R. How about that eye issue you just mentioned? The, eye, the, the IAF? Yeah, the, the, the focusing on the eyes. Is that just on the new one? No. So the IAF, the question is, is the IAF only on the new body? It is not. It is on previous bodies. It's just every time they come out with a new camera, they've improved it. Okay. So the A7R2 also has IAF, and I used it a lot. But as, let me do this again. As Daniel turns, the, the A7R2 wouldn't be able to track as much as he turned. It would start losing it as more of his face went away. Whereas this camera gets it all the way until the eye is gone. And whenever they come out with a new camera, who knows when that will be. People ask me all the time. Nobody tells me anything. Uh, yes? With the IAF, if you were to shoot tighter just of his face, and he was to, to go like 45 degrees, let's say you wanted to focus on his back eye instead of his front eye. It always goes to the front eye. I, IAF is always going to go to the front eye. If you want to go to the back eye, you'll have to manually focus. Okay. All right, we're going to go back to the computer. No, you're not done. <laughs> now we're actually going to take a picture. You thought the pressure was off. Oh, Daniel, what, what is your Instagram? It's uh, Daniel G C A S T R I L L O N. It's last and very foreign. All right, wait. <laughs> We're going to come back so that the mic is right next to you. Uh, Instagram is Daniel G C A S T is in Tom R I L L O N. Lost, okay, right? I'm sh uh, you all got that right. <laughs> That is long. Tony Gale's photo is a lot shorter. Yeah. All right. So one of the things about portraiture, much like everything else, is there's a million ways to do anything. How many of you have been seeing, been inundated with the masterclass ads for Annie Leibovitz's masterclass? All right. And in that, she, in those ads, she says. Everybody says when you're shooting a portrait, you should make the, com the subject comfortable. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> I believe it is true. So it works for Annie to not have them comfortable. She's 
been shooting a lot longer than me and has made m way more money than I ever will. So clearly there's more than one way to approach it. For me, it's important that the subject be comfortable. So, how are you feeling, Daniel? Great. <laughs> what I'm shooting with is a Lastolite Silver Umbrella to start with, and a Lastolite Highlight in the background. The highlight will make a nice white background. We're going to put this really close so that we're not entirely blocking the screen. Can you guys still see the screen? All right. And how many people use these meters? Anybody? All right, a handful. Everybody should, should still use a meter. Every time I do a talk, I watch a bunch of other people's talks to see if there's anything that I should make sure to include or exclude. I saw a comment from somebody that was, why would you use a meter with digital? Can't you just look at the screen? It is true that you can look at the screen, but if you're using multiple lights in particular, you're going to get where you need to be a lot faster with a meter. One light, uh, you can sort of do it. Available light, I get that. I'd still rather use a meter. But in available light, especially if what you see is what you're going to get, I understand why you might not use a meter. But if you're using strobes, for me, again, that's one of those things. Some people don't use meters. For me, it's a lot faster to use a meter. So to start with, we're going to see how bright that background is. This meter in particular has a spot meter. I'm using the Gauss and Starlight 2. All right, so it's metering at about f16. That would give me a neutral gray, so I'm going to open up three stops from that to actually get it white. Does that make sense? If you want a white background, you want it brighter than what it meters at. Because your meter's always going for gray, middle gray. And if you get middle gray, then it's gray and not white, and you'll see all the wrinkles. So 16, 11, 8, we'll say 5, 6 and a half. Actually, let me turn that down a little. This is group A. Try that again. All right, so we're going to shoot at five, six and a half. Let's see what the front's like. Too bright. This is group B. Five, six and a half. And of course, when you shoot tethered, or when you shoot it all on your meter, that gets you in the ballpark, and then sometimes you change it anyway. Uh, one other thing, actually, that is cool about this camera, if it matters to you, and I know people it does, is finally you can shoot tethered and shoot to the card at the same time. In the past, with Sony, you had to either shoot to a card or to a computer, but now I can shoot to both at once. To be honest, I don't like to do that. It slows it down. So I'm going to take my card out rather than just turning it off because it's easier this way. And something to consider is that with a laptop in particular, if you're shooting tethered, sometimes the power is not stable on a laptop, the output. So I have this device that allows me to plug it into two USB ports and get a more constant power source. We'll see how that goes. Attaching camera. All right, I'm using Capture One for Sony. If you shoot with Sony, you can get Capture One for Sony free. If you want Capture One Pro for Sony, which lets you tether, I think it's $50. It's relatively inexpensive. 79 now. 79? All right, apparently it's 79. It's still $300 less than buying the normal. Uh, and I'm going to go to a tighter lens. I'm going to use the 8518, one of my favorite lenses. I have a lot of favorite lenses. Whenever somebody asks me what my favorite lens is, it just depends on what you're going to do. 
My other favorite lenses are this one, the 24-70 G Master, the 12-24 G, that's a great lens. The 100 to 400 G Master, that's a great lens. It's a lot of great lenses. Let's see if this will let me shoot. Oh, no, because I had, cannot shoot with a, I had to shoot without card off. So I'm just gonna put it back in. All right, this first one is just to test to make sure that the light is, whoops. I forgot it's on 10 frames a second. Which I was gonna demonstrate. So, all right, it feels a little dark to me, right? So I'll go to five, six. Um, that is something I wanted to demonstrate. So, mechanical shutter, 10 frames a second. Now your lights need to be able to shoot that fast. And these lights, which they don't make anymore because the company went out of business, but which probably means you can buy them cheap. Um, I, had, I tested them to see what power I needed to be at to be able to shoot that fast. With these five, if I'm at five, I can get 10 frames a second. How many people think that was cool, 10 frames a second? I do. All right, half of you. What type of lights are they? They're Bowens XMTs. I believe that B&H probably still has them that they would probably happily sell you. Uh, they're really good lights, it's a shame. But now that we've impressed you all with the fact that it can do 10 frames, oh, and it missed on three. It didn't get the last three. We're gonna go back to a normal. So Daniel, I'm gonna shoot as if I were actually shooting you. Sounds great. So one of the things I like to do, and this is, it works for me, it doesn't work for other people necessarily, is we're gonna talk while we're shooting. Let's do it. Because for me, what that means is I'm gonna get some really terrible expressions as he's mid-sentence or whatever. But in between those, you get really, really natural, comfortable expressions. I just met Daniel because he was one of the people that was here early. We don't go way back. We did not grow up together. I think he's younger than me, so there is that. Um, so, Daniel, where'd you grow up? Florida. What part of Florida? Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. I've been to Tampa once. I was, to be fair, I was unimpressed, yes. Uh, Although we stayed in a really nice hotel. I wish I could remember what it was. Was it in the ghetto? I don't, it was like, it was when I was assisting in 1998, so I have no idea. I just remember it was a nice hotel. I think there was a pool on the roof. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, you wouldn't, all right. So what brought you to New York? I hate Florida. That's an excellent reason. <laughs> and how long have you been here? Two years now. And are, are you doing photography? What are, yes, passion editorial. Passion editorial, how's that going? Great, actually. If you could shoot anything in the world, what would it be? I can shoot anything in the world or for anybody? Answer the question however you like. I would have to say I would want to shoot for uh, Vogue Paris. Vogue Paris, not Vogue US, but Vogue Paris. Even though Vogue US has a bigger distribution. Yep. All right. Uh, more freedom. Okay, fair enough. And what would you shoot? What kind of story? I mean, I know fashion, but that's, right. a, big, that's a big tent. I don't know, it changes all depends on what music I'm listening to. My stories that I, I shoot are always, depending on the music, I always have a music behind it, whether it be classical, Bach, or even Lil Yachty, whatever the case may be. But it's always, it's always depending on the music. Okay. So if, I so were if you were shooting it tomorrow. It tomorrow? Yeah. Vogue, Vogue Paris calls you today. They say, look, we need to shoot tomorrow. Make it happen. What are you going to do? I'm probably going to do a moody, uh, moody black and white image, probably on the water. Um, wow, on the water in winter. Why not? There's, there's uh, I, feel, I feel for your model. No, behind it. Cool. Probably feel from next month. Um, probably out in Montauk, actually, where I live in Ride Over. Nice. Um, and then just really a lot of emotions. It's kind of like, kind of depressing, but showing the times, just the way you can still tie in. Um, 
kind of like the 80s and 90s, quarter uh, journalism, same for the 70s. Okay. So with a little a bit of a modern taste, no angles. No angles. Be creative, try to be different. Long lines, wide lines. Both. All right. If it's close up, obviously uh, wide lens, but. Close up is wide lens. So you like wide lens for portraits. Okay. How wide? 35. So fairly wide, but not not crazy. Yeah, not like. Not like my 12, 24. Yeah, no. All right. Did you see Birdman? Did not. Lots of wide angle close ups. And the Irving Penn show that they added the Met a few months ago. I did see that. Lots of wide angle. I didn't realize he shot so much wide angle. No, that was actually really good. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Irving Penn. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to, if Irving Penn were still alive, I'd like to know if he believed that you should make your portrait subject comfortable. Annie and I disagree. I'm going to guess Irving Penn and I agreed. Well, it's always about the report before you're building. You get really stiff photos. Yeah, you get, I don't want somebody to look anxious. No. Look the person no. behind it. You're telling the story at the end of the day. Yeah. And as you can see, I shoot a lot because it's digital. Who cares? <laughs> like, why not shoot a lot? Is there a reason to not shoot? Do I need to only shoot 20? No. Yeah, you got to edit it. Though. Yeah, but you can, so relax for a second. So looking at what we have here. I can just make my thumbnails big. Whoop. That's not my thumbnails. Um, I can just look at everything, and I'll be able to quickly pull things out. So obviously, that's bad, right? Blinks are not good. No strobe is not good. I kind of <laughs> there's that's the best one. See, but that's a nice relaxing expression. Because I'm standing off camera, he's looking at me and not the camera. That one's, I think my light's a little contrasty, but. But I can quickly go through them. It's much faster than, say, Lightroom. It, yes? So when you quickly go through them while, you know, right after you shot, while it's fresh, is there a way that you're, like, maybe starring something as a select or? Yeah, I'm putting it into the garbage as a reject. Right I, I'm not because I'm not looking. So the question is, am I editing essentially as I go? Am I making yeah. selects or am I making rejects as I go? And I'm not. After. Uh, after, the, after the shoot, I'll go through. So my editing process is I go through everything. Anything that's a maybe gets a one star. Then I look at all the one stars again. And we'll then give things two stars. And depending on how many pictures I have left, I might give some things three stars. But usually my process is tight enough that two stars is as far as I go, um, unless I'm looking for one picture. So if I'm shooting for a client, I'll go through anything that's not a blink or a terrible expression gets processed. And then I'll go through those, and anything I like gets one star. And I'll give my clients, here's the folder of my selects. Here's the folder of everything else. Typically, they'll only look at my folder of selects. It's rare that they pull out of the other folder. But I've had too many times when they say, can we see the rest, that I just do it. I just give it to them to make selects from. But I'm not, uh, but I'm not worried about that. And always pull out the bad ones. Yeah. I've had, way, I'm sure with editor, so many clients they, they make their selects, and you're like, why did I even give them that picture? It's not even just, that's not my favorite picture, but that's a bad picture. Why did you pick the bad picture? I had a client that picked a, that chose a frame where the subject was blinking. I think maybe they felt like they looked relaxed. I'm not sure. So I gave them that frame, and then I gave them a second version where I had taken eyes from another frame and put it in there because it looked terrible with the blink, and they still ran the blink. Now, I should have done a better job in not giving them the blink. But, ugh. And with this camera, since you can shoot so fast and so much, 
do you ever do anything like go into the photo mechanic first to cut more? Uh, so the question is, because it shoots so much, do I ever use something like photo mechanic? I do use photo mechanic occasionally, yes. It depends on the volume of pictures. I have one client, it's a nonprofit, um, that works with school children. Oh, actually, I'll give them a shout. Child Center of New York. They do good work. Um, and when I shoot for them, I'll shoot 1,500 to 2,000 pictures in two to three hours. Like, it's just ridiculous because it's a situation where I'm in a room and there's all these kids doing whatever that they're doing, and I'm running around getting pictures of that. So they're not really, like I might say, can you look at me please? But for the most part, I'm trying to get the right moment and because they're running and moving and doing whatever, you have to shoot a lot. And so in those situations, I will sometimes use something like Photo Mechanic because it is so fast for editing, for culling. Editing in the sense of removing pictures, not Photoshopping. Um, and if I was shooting sports, like honestly, the 10 frames a second, You're not gonna use that for anything that's not moving. Like for portraits, it's crazy. I just shot however many frames that all look basically the same because nobody's moving that fast unless they're moving. So for portraits, it doesn't make sense. For a, you know, a dancer jumping or if you're shooting sports, it makes a lot of sense. You know, athletes in a studio. If you're shooting sports on a field, the A9 will shoot 20 frames a second in silent shutter. Uh, but not mechanical shutter. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 20 frames a second is, yeah, it is a lot. 10 frames a second is a lot. Yeah, but there are times when I like having the 10. I have photographed dancers in a studio with this camera, and when you've got somebody doing that leap, to be able to start as they're starting to move, shoot through the entire thing, and at the end, sometimes five frames a second, you miss that perfect moment. With 10, you gotta try hard to miss that moment. Yeah. All right, we're gonna come in and do a little, so I'm using eye autofocus here to come in tight, whoops. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off 10 frames a second, unless you guys like feeling like you're in some crazy dance club. Is your forehead feeling? No, I saw like a line on my forehead. Oh, a line, but not shine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Because I do have blotting paper. <laughs> I'm good. Always carry blotting paper. You get it at drugstores, and I have no idea where I bought this. Dwayne Reed? Maybe. It could have been Dwayne Reed. It could have been, I don't know. It lasts forever because this is 50 sheets and I use like one sheet every three weeks, so. But it's got a little bit of powder. If someone's got a little bit of shine, you just blot them, it's a magic. Turn your body this way a little bit more, yep. And then turn your face towards me a little bit, good. Let's see how that looks, huh? Let's see, that's cool, I like that one. That's my favorite one so far. All right. So, we're gonna go through some expressions. So this is what I want. I want you to look super serious. A Little bit of a smile. A Little bit more. A Little bit more. A Little bit more. A Little bit more. Ridiculously big. So, did you see what happened? I don't know if I caught it, but he did ridiculously big, which was super silly. But almost always after that one, people give you a real smile. Because the ridiculous big, big one is, it's ridiculous. Nobody wants that picture. But everybody thinks it's silly, so then you smile afterwards. Assuming that you want to smile. See, let's see, this is, so that's ridiculously big, and then that's a real smile. All right, let's do this. Looks super mean. Okay, relax. Okay, soft. All right, smile. Sometimes when you tell people to look super mean, they crack up. So, not you. 
you, you, my demonstration failed. <laughs> I quit. I can't work like this. All right. So, so let's mix it up. Yeah. You can. We'll let you stick around for another second, and then we'll uh, bring Chelsea up. I'm just putting my camera on a tripod. So one thing I really like about this light as well, the last light highlight, is it's great as a backdrop, but it's also great as a main light. So I'm going to use this. my magnetic background holder. Meter again. So stand right here. This is now our main light. Two, eight. So nice and wide. So our meter says 209, so 28. I'll open up a little. Nice and shallow, that'll be a good demo for the eye autofocus. You never have enough cable. Right. Oh, you know. How many of you shoot raw, everybody? How many of you shoot with gray cards? The rest of you should shoot with gray cards, and I should be shooting with one, too. See how warm that looks? Tony, on this one, the focus seems to be more like on the corner of this the silver corner of the left, what's the dot? Well, we'll take a look. First, we're going to do this. So I can give you the correct color. One thing that's tricky, because I'm not on um, oh, the monitor is just warm. Because I'm not on a tripod, it's possible that I'm moving the camera after the focus. But is it the point of the eye focus that no matter what you're doing, it's going to pick the If I keep the button pressed, which I didn't. So we'll try that again. It, it, it does well, but it won't fix everything in the world in terms of user error. So now I am keeping it depressed. So you're holding the eye focus button down even while you're hitting the shutter button? Yes. Yes. I, so I know some photographers who believe that everyone in the world who's a professional should use back button autofocus. I don't agree with those people. Everybody I know who started out as a photojournalist uses back button autofocus. Most of the people I know who did not start as photojournalists do not. So I still have focus on the shutter, and then I autofocus is the AF on button on the back. Let's see. So this focused on that eye. That looks pretty sharp. You can see the light. What light is that? Now we're too close to be. I don't even know all that stuff that's re reflecting in there. But pretty sharp. We're at, uh, I don't know. 100%. So now it's this other eye. As he moved, it shifted eyes. Because it's looking for what it thinks is the closest. Yeah, that one's sharper. Oh, that's my cable. That's the cable hanging from the camera. That's what that is. And I'm shooting with the 8518. So 
You can imagine this would be quite challenging to get without eye autofocus. Nothing is going to be 100% 100% of the time, except that nothing is 100% 100% of the time. Uh, but it works almost all the time, at least for me. All right, you can take a break. Let's let's shift it up and bring Chelsea up. How you feeling, Chelsea? Good. Do you feel the pressure? No. Good. There isn't any pressure. I'm we want we. Shorter than he is. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Here. Right here. How are you feeling? Good. No Instagram. No, it's all right. <laughs> Twitter. Nope. <laughs> Have you heard of social media? Yeah, I have it. I just doesn't need to be blasted. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know plenty of people who whose uh, Instagram is private or whatever. It's fine. All right. So, what kind of things do you like to photograph, Chelsea? I do self portraits. Oh, so this is how does it feel to be portraited and not selfed? Yeah, it's a little weird to have someone else on the other side. <laughs> well, and how are your self portraits going? Are you thinking about photographing other people too? Sure. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. Weddings. Is, you do do weddings or you want to do weddings? I do weddings. And how are those? Long. Long? I find them to be very stressful, which yeah. is why I don't shoot them. Oh, yeah. Well, that's fair. I think there's nothing wrong with shooting weddings. You can get a bridezilla. Yeah, it's just there's so many people that are so anxious. Yeah. For something that should be such a wonderful, happy day, there's so much anxiety. Yeah, Jack of all trades for the weddings. Yeah. But more power to you. Get a lot of sleep. <laughs> well, if you, uh, if you give me a card the next time somebody asks me if I do weddings. <laughs> you can say, go here. <laughs> all my friends that used to do weddings don't shoot weddings okay. anymore. It so. takes a lot. Sometimes you got to take a break. Enjoy the winter months. Yeah. And how long have you been in New York, did you say? Two years. Two years? From Utah before that or in Texas? Texas. Where in Texas? San Antonio. I've been to San Antonio once. I liked the... The Riverwalk. Yeah, the Riverwalk was nicer than I thought. Yes. A friend of mine told me to do the Riverwalk in San Antonio, and I thought, eh, it's going to be awfully cheesy. Uh, it's fun. Yeah, it was nice. Cute. Let's look at... See, that's... Look at that. I like the one right before this. This, this, is, this one, your new Facebook yeah. profile? Perfect. <laughs> we'll order up some 8x10s. So this is an example of what I was talking about, how I like to shoot where we're talking. You end up with this. <laughs> Nobody wants that. But this one feels real to me. Some of these others feel real, but like that one looks like, why do you keep asking me these questions? And honestly, all I care about is if I have one that I really like, that's good. Now more is better. If I were shooting you commercially, we'd be shooting a lot, lot more. But shooting a few is good. So let me just do one other thing with this light. You're still there, don't worry. We're going to switch the background. I love my magnet. Yeah, isn't it cool? I didn't know they did that. Yeah, so these, I'm using last to light backgrounds. And then last to light has a magnetic crossbar. And you just. I don't know if the crossbar will work on other. It just depends on what the, the rim is made out of. Because it has to be magnetic steel. So it could work with others. I'm not sure. But it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right, see it right here? You can also use it as a really nice front. Let's see if I'm, I might be too close. Nope, right there. Let's see how this looks. Let's make it a little brighter. Let's see, nope.
All right, you ready? We're gonna go crazy now. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Uh, see there, it missed focus. Did they all come in already? No, they're all down there. <laughs> awesome. But right there, if that one isn't focus, nope. I'm, I'm a little close on the focus. I'm right at the edge of what it can do. So as I moved it. Uh, oh, so bright. So bright. It's very bright. <sighs> Your future's so bright. You know. All right, we're going to try it one more time. Okay, I'll try not to move. All right. Well, you don't need to worry about moving. I, it's just if you come too close, then it, then it loses focus. It's like a machine gun. I just think it's cool that it does that. All right, let's see what we've got. They're coming in. So this would be faster if I didn't have the card in here because it's also writing to the card. Well, that one's nice. I like that one. <laughs> and that's what it looks like when those stroke and just ambient. All right, we're going to do. Was that a question back there? Yeah, sorry. In this case, since the depth of field is so shallow, is there any reason like you wouldn't raise either the ISO, maybe you like to? 800 instead of 100 or get more f-stops? There's a lot of things I could have done if I wanted more f-stops. I like shallow depth of field. But it's too shallow because of that. Uh, on some of them, yeah. On some of them, it was too much. Uh, part of it is the close focus on that, ra on that lens. I was a little too close. So as soon as you move forward, it's incapable of focusing, so I could have used depth of field. There's a lot of power on this light. I could have turned it up. I just like seeing the shallow and take my chances sometimes. But I should have not been quite so close. That would have solved more of the problem than the depth of field. Just being not right on top where it can't focus that close. Do you want me, do you want me to do that again? Yeah. <laughs> Fold it like a taco. The reflector that I can always struggle. It's a taco trick. Just afterwards, we can do a little. Uh, anybody who wants to try. It takes a little getting used to. The first time I did it, uh, I had to watch a YouTube video because I actually had this one, and it's bigger than that. And I just, for the life of me, couldn't get it to work. So what we're going to do here is a black background with a little color. So you're wearing green. All right, let's get a little, um, we could do red, we could do orange, we could do sort of a teal, or we could do blue. So let's, I'm going to let people here vote. All right, how many people want to see blue? One. How many people want to see orange? One. How many people want to see red? Like six. And how many people want to see teal? All right, red it is. We can always do a second one, don't worry. You'll feel very Christmassy with the red and the green. So for this, we're going to take this light out and use this one. Oh, my modeling light is on. I usually leave my modeling lights off all the time because I don't want, I don't want to see them. If I'm shooting shallow in particular, that sometimes that little bit of light makes a difference. I'm not, I must have turned it on on the uh, remote. 
There we go. All right, so for that saturated color that I mentioned, you just put a gel on the light. This is also actually an example of where using a gray card or at least setting your white balance correctly is important. Because the way all cameras work, Sony or anybody else, is that they look at the whole scene and using its magic computer mumbo jumbo, it balances out the color to what it thinks is neutral. So if you have something that's a very significant color cast, it will try and correct for that. So we're adding a bunch of red to the background. The camera might see all that red and shift everything green because it doesn't know we want that red to be red. Where I find it to be really an issue is if you're shooting, oh, let's put a better picture on the screen while we're. Um, if you're shooting in the woods in particular with all that green, the color with auto white balance just gets crazy. So I find using a doing either a custom white balance or a gray card makes a big difference in those circumstances. Does that make sense? Somebody online is screaming at their computer right now, saying, no, no, don't do it that way. Whoever that person is, more power to you, do it whatever way you like, if it makes you happy. I'm not here to judge much. When I teach at colleges, I tell people there's a lot of ways to do everything. If an instructor tells you this is the way to do it and your grade depends on that, do it that way. Otherwise, there's a million ways to do anything. All right, we're going to make this very side light because I don't want it to hit the background too much. I'm sorry. All right, let's meter this. You can see I have all of this space at the front of the room here at B&H, and I've managed to put stuff everywhere. No matter how much room I have, you it's never enough. Moved in. I've moved in. Alan, I'm never leaving. I'm just going to keep my gear here. You're a welcome roommate. I'm going to need keys. No problem. It's on the landlord today. Yeah. All right, five, six on the front. 11 on the back. That's a lot more than I want. So in this instance, I do want it to balance a little bit more, to be a little more even, because I'm not trying to blow it out like I would with a white. Four eight, so turn it up a little. We'll try there. So I'm getting just over five six on the background, and then five six on the front. feeling. Okay. Whoops. Remember to turn your motor drive off. <laughs> I know, you gotta, gotta use a it safety. It's... All right, the front feels a little dim, but you can see that red saturating in the background. I'm actually just going to open up on everything because I want it to be brighter overall. So one of the tricky things with metering that background is you have to pick where you're metering. And I metered for the hot spot, which is right behind your head, so we're not actually seeing that brightest point, which is why everything looks a little dark back there. On the front, I just probably didn't put the meter right, which is why it's a little dark. Somebody's yelling right online about that too, I promise. Don't meter like that. Oh my goodness. All right, that's much better. So it's very side lit because I don't want the foreground light to be affecting the background light. In a perfect world, I would just spread out that distance. But I'm already using all my space for some reason. Uh, but the red is cool, right? Yeah. Let's just, let's, 
adjust this a little. If I do this, where it starts hitting the background, we'll probably see it wash out a little. But it'll be more flattering on the front. So the light's better on her, on Chelsea, and it, it didn't impact the background too much. You can see the top, the darks are a little more gray than black now, just because of the change of the angle. All right, I'm actually, and only three of you use gray cards, right? I'm gonna show you all right now why you should all use gray cards. Where did my, if I can figure out what I did with mine. Yep. So we're going to do this and mess with our color. All right, we can all agree that's terrible, right? That's good. I mean, Chelsea is on the surface of the sun. <laughs> All right, because we're using Capture One and I have it set, it takes whatever settings I applied to the last frame and applies it to the next frame, which is why that second one is this. Now it's back to perfect. Even if it does, doesn't look perfect, it is. It is neutral. Um, my laptop screen is calibrated, but it's not necessarily calibrated to this. So it's, but that gray card, when things are off, super easy. I think we've all had those times where we're trying to correct color, moving the sliders back and forth. I think it's right. Then you look at it the next day and you're like, Ugh, no, no, it's still not right. With this, you get to neutral. Now neutral might not be what you want, Maybe you want it warm or cold or whatever. And you can always change that, but if you start at neutral, you know you're starting in the middle. Right, make sense? All right, I think, Alan, I'm just gonna take questions now. Does that work for you? Uh, it's all up to you, brother. All right, Chelsea, you can sit down for a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chelsea and Daniel. Um, so who has questions? Who has more questions? Yes. Okay. You're here pitching the A7R3. You haven't once mentioned the touchscreen. Why is that? The reason I haven't mentioned the touchscreen on the A7R3 is because I don't use it. Um, for the people that love the touchscreen, the, the 6500 has it, the A7R3 has it. I think the A9 has it, but I'm not 100% on that. For the people that want it, it's there. For me, I, I never use it, ever. Have you ever tried focusing with the focus point? Uh, no, because I would rather just use, uh, I'm typically looking through right. the viewfinder, and so to use the touch screen, I have to move out a little. And I will sometimes shoot just looking at the back, like when I was shooting Daniel and we were talking. Um, but for me, I'd rather use the joystick. Uh, where I think the focus screen, the touch screen focus is really useful, actually is in video because you can rack focus very easily using the touch screen. But to be honest, since this camera's only been out six weeks, the only video I've shot with it is just testing it to see how it looks. I haven't shot, I have a project coming up in a month or so where I will be using it and I may use the touch screen to focus at that point. But for stills, I just don't use it. Quick question from the uh, internet. Are they telling me I meter wrong? <laughs> Um, David from wherever says, does the iFocus work in video mode while recording? Does the iFocus work in video mode while recording? You know, that's a good question. I do not know the answer to that. But what I can do is just try it right now and tell you. So I'm going to put it on video. Okay, so I, uh, all right. So it appears not. Now somebody may tell me I'm doing it wrong because I haven't tried this. But when I try and do it, it says this operation or setting not available as follows. Um, that's if I'm on the video setting. If I just switch to aperture priority normal where it will work and then start recording video. 
Uh, it does not appear to work well in video. It's possible that there's a way to do that, but just quickly trying it, I do not see that working. Sorry. It would be cool. Yes? Do you have any sense of how well iAutofocus works with the A7R3 versus with the A9? Um, a bit. So the A9, the iAutofocus was so much better than the stuff before because the camera was so much newer. I mean, the R2 came out in fall of 2016, I think. And the A9 came out 18 months later. So they had 18 months to improve it. The R3 came out about six months after that. Um, from my quick tests, I think it's better on the R3 than the A9, but only barely. The A9, the eye autofocus is still amazing. And if I shot sports, I would buy that camera in a second. <clears throat> I still have to buy these cameras, just to be clear. I get a discount, but I, um, for me, because I shoot people and portraits and then landscapes for fun, having the higher resolution of the R3 makes a lot more sense. If I shot sports and I was a photojournalist, A9, me being me, A7R3. Yes? Uh, I'll come to you next. If this was a job and you had to deliver a picture immediately, like, you know, you say, hey, call the art director and say, I've got your shot. This is what you got. Call the shirt. Call your checker. Yep. Call the cover of Time Magazine. Is there a Great. way you could deliver this one picture or a couple of pictures right out of Capture One? So, I mean, I could process it and email it. I can send them from the camera to my phone. So I could send it directly from the card to my phone. But from Capture One, I'd have to process it and then email it to myself. And you think that would be the way you would go about doing it? Yeah. Yeah. I have shot, when I'm not shooting tethered, I've done lots of projects where the client needs something for social media right away. You know, we're shooting something and they want people to know that we're shooting. And I will send them a picture from the camera to either their phone, if they load Sony Play Memories Mobile, or to my phone immediately. Yes? OK, getting back to the um, uh, whole presentation, uh, portrait subjects, you know, building up a report. Let's say you mm -hmm. have some, you already have uh, some portfolio to start with. But maybe, maybe this is a new, something you want to go back into, you want to get into it. Sure. And you're going to approach your approach. Maybe I'm going to use theater because I have a background with theater. OK. Uh, and do it Sounds great. But if you were about to approach this and look at um, uh, modeling agencies, projects, young people that are just getting into this and have absolute crap of portfolios, how are you going to approach them? How are you going to get there? Uh, so is the question how are you going to build that portfolio from the beginning? If you were about to do it now. Yes, if I was starting from scratch. You mentioned yeah, developing portraits. You mentioned yep. clients, friends, yep. uh, strangers on the street. How would you do that and what would you play on to, to build it up? So how would I build that initial portfolio from scratch at the beginning? Correct. So you have some experience. You've actually used the camera right. before. So you didn't just buy the camera today for the first time. Correct. You can point it in the right direction. Correct. Okay. Maybe you got some experience, but maybe not. So I, the way I did start when I first started shooting was friends. Um, you know, that's especially when you're starting out, I think that's a great way to do it because your friends are going to be supportive. Like my friend said my pictures were great, and they probably thought they were great. They were terrible. Almost all the pictures I look at from when I first started getting into photography, were, they weren't necessarily terrible, but they weren't good. You know, there's a handful that were decent, but I wouldn't, like I would never use those now. But for your friends, they're better than what they've seen because you're pointing in the right direction and you're not using a phone. Presumably, there's one photographer who does really well with a phone, Brad Mangin. But other than that, a camera is going to be better. Um, so I would start with just people you know. If you, people you work with, people you're acquaintances with, people you know, um, and then you could ask there, ask the people you know if they know people. So that's one easy way to start, just because they're predisposed to say yes. Uh, and if they're, I think we all know people that don't like getting their picture taken. 
since I asked you guys, only two people <laughs> wanted to get their pictures taken or were willing to. I shouldn't even say wanted to. Um, so you may know people that don't want to get their pictures taken. They could love you to death, but they're like, no, no, no. I don't like getting my picture taken. Um, you could tell them you'll let them look through and that you won't show anybody anything they're not happy with. I don't normally give people approval, but that's a way to get started. I mean, what I normally tell people when they say, no, 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 I'm not good at taking pictures, I say, that's great, because I'm taking the picture. So, you know, it just relaxes them a little. And then the real secret, if you want to be more photogenic, and I tell people this too, is that you just have to let your picture get taken so many times that you stop caring. And when you're relaxed, you're more photogenic. When you're nervous, nobody looks good. Um, so start with your friends or acquaintances or whoever, depending on if your friends are interesting. Um, I'm sure they are, but you know we all have friends that are more and less interesting to photograph. Um, and then start, you, you mentioned you have a theater background. Yeah. So actors are great. And they all, there's so many actors that want pictures that that's a great way to get in. Yeah, especially if you're just giving them pictures in exchange for their time. Yeah. Because my daughter was into it and her friends. I used to do, some of them actually wound up in equity, but I wasn't doing it as a business. So right now, I'm always going to start from scratch. I have a background, I do have some, but I will be basically starting from scratch, not as a photographer, but sure. I had to snap a picture. But because I didn't build a portfolio to do this as a business. Yeah, so you're starting from scratch. Uh, what I would honestly do if I was super, if you're feeling super motivated, is find a day, pick a day, schedule as many people as you can half an hour apart. Just knock it out. I did a shoot last year, I think I photographed like 16 people, but just half an hour apart. Same background, same lighting. I just wanted to do a project where everybody was lit the same. Um, and it, it wasn't hard to get people to do it. And some of them will work out and you'll show them to people and some of them won't. But it's, I think, more about volume at the beginning. There's, this is something that I feel strongly about and other people feel equally strongly the other way. That if you shoot a lot, you will get better and you will get better work. If you spend a lot of time on every shoot trying to make it perfect, it might be perfect, but I think ultimately, not that you should rush the other stuff, if you shoot more, you're gonna get better faster than if you spend all day on one shot trying to make that perfect. There's a book called uh, Art and Fear, and in it they tell the story about a pottery class where half the class's grade was based on quantity. They just weighed how much work they made at the end, and the other was based on one single piece of work. And the work, the side of the class that was based on quantity had much better work because they were just constantly making new stuff and learning from their mistakes. Whereas if you're just like, I'm going to make the por perfect portrait right now and I'm going to spend all the time to make that happen, you sometimes can't get out of your own way. Now, again, there are people who completely disagree with me and will say to do it the other way. And if it works for them, great. I think for most people, take as many pictures as you can. Not just click, 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 but you know, think about them, but don't. Don't obsess too much about perfection, just obsess on getting better and building that body of work. What's that? Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. And they say perfect practice makes perfect. Uh, other questions? Yes? When you shoot portraits, do you ever or have you ever used continuous light? Uh, the question is, do I ever use continuous light when shooting portraits? Sometimes. I ha certainly have. When I started out, I bought Home Depot clamp lights. B&H has better versions of those. They can take bigger bulbs, because the ones at Home Depot are limited in the wattage. You can get ones here with nice wooden handles. And then um, they're inexpensive. That's what I started with. And then I moved on to better and better lights. Uh, now, I will use a continuous lights for portraits, but primarily if it's a project where I'm using video and stills. Um, I did something 
for the winter, for somebody for the Winter Olympics a couple years ago. And they wanted some video and some stills. So for those, I used continuous light, so I only had to light it once. If I'm only going to do stills, I'll almost always use strobes because I've got more flexibility. Continuous lights are limited because they only get so bright. And it's actually sometimes harder for people because even though they're not as bright, they're looking right at them and so their eyes can get squinty. Uh, yes, I'll go to you and then you. Yes. Uh, when you're shooting with a, a client who's particular, yep. in a, like a controlled environment, you have a, a tether and maybe an external monitor, and how often are you consulting with the client over specific details in the shot and and what size screen are you guys looking at together, or the laptop, or? All right, so. People have bad vision, you know, the clients can. It, it depends things. on the client, the budget, and the situation. Yeah. If I have the room and the budget, I have a 27 inch monitor that I bring on a rolling stand. So it's got a little VESA mount that attaches to the top of a stand on the back. And then I have a 30 foot HDMI cable. So it'll run from the laptop to that monitor. It can be anywhere it needs to be. Um, typically in that situation, what we do is we start out, I, make, I get it close, so I get the lighting. If it's a shoot like that, I have an assistant and probably a digital tech. Mm -hmm. So the tech is on the computer, the assistant, we're shooting tests. We get the light where I think it is and everything where I think it needs to be. I will, depending on the client, show them that test with the assistant so that they can say, yep, that's the ballpark. Then we'll move the subject in. I'll shoot a couple of frames. I'll say, how does it look? 99% of the time they will say, it looks good. So you're not working beyond you know, they, you're taking them every step of the way. Yeah. You're, you're walking them through this. And yeah. Because you don't want any surprises. Well, if the client's not happy, yeah. then I'm not happy. I mean, ultimately, I'm there to give them the picture they, they need. If the picture they need is not a picture I'm happy with, I will then also try and shoot a picture I'm happy with. Because sometimes, to be honest, the right picture, which is the client, the picture for the client, is not the best picture. I want to make the best picture but more important is making the right picture. So, and ideally the client is watching the pictures come in, and so they can say, you know, oh no, it's really important that we see this and we don't see it. I have a catalog client, <clears throat> they're very picky about what you see, like we need to see the stitching on this shoulder, but not too much of it. So they'll watch as stuff comes in, and they'll say, oh no, he." the model turned too far or not far enough. Because otherwise you end up with 100 pictures that they can't use, mm -hmm. and that's that's no good. Excellent. thank you. Certainly, yes? Uh, these pictures look great straight out of the camera. Do you, uh, after you're done with the shoot, do you tend to ever send them straight out, or do you do post, and if you do do post, like what in capture one might be by two or three? Um, it depends on the use. So. If I'm shooting for a client, what, unless I know that they want a special treatment, I'll send them low res straight out of camera. Like, I'll white balance. If I feel like the shadows or the highlights need to be tweaked a little, I'll do that. But other than that, I typically don't do anything to start with. I send them all that as low res, they make their selects, and then I'll go and look at each one individually. So <clears throat> it might be a situation where I feel like the skin is just a little bright, I'll bring down the, the highlights or the, you know, there's some detail getting lost in the hair, I'll bring up the shadows. Um, I might adjust the curves a little, add a little clarity or contrast, but it depends on the situation. There's nothing I do 100% of the time, except white balance. And hey, do you think uh, they would be acceptable to clients, like straight out of the camera, without you tweaking it? It depends on the client and the use. Uh, last week, I, no, not last week, last week I was CES. The week before, I did some executive portraits. They're going to want retouching. So they're fine with it out of camera, but they want, they still, once they've made their selects, those are going to get retouched. And I include that. I include processing and, and light retouching as a line item on my estimate. Uh, but for some other clients, yeah, straight out of camera. It just depends on the use. Is there a point that you won't be shooting at your max resolution? This nope. camera seems so high that you know the final use and maybe in print, you 
you can never really take advantage. Um, so the question is, do I ever not shoot at max resolution? I always shoot at the maximum resolution. And then I may not deliver the maximum resolution to the client. I mean, or it's, is it, could it be too sharp? Could it be too detailed? I, I have had shots where I'm like, that's a lot of pores. Um, but typically, that's not the case. If I need to, I will res it down for delivery. But I am firmly of the belief that you want to capture the best quality image you can, because that gives you the most flexibility. You can always do things to it later, but if you start small and then wish that you had a higher quality image, it's too late. It's the same reason I always shoot raw. I'm always going to shoot raw. Have a good trip. Thank you. Um, he's going to Brazil, I think. Yeah. Um, I always shoot raw because I want the best quality. Uh, I've seen plenty of people say, oh, no, just shoot JPEG and make sure your white balance is correct and your exposure is correct. And you will get an adequate picture there. But if anything went wrong or you want to change anything, you're going to be sad that you shot a JPEG. Yes? In addition to the Sony cameras, do you ever shoot in medium format? Um, I don't. If I had a project that I needed to, I would. But the 42 megapixels on this is a lot. Yeah. It's a big file. Um, so I don't, I haven't needed to. Yes? Also, uh, you mentioned that sometimes you're using the digital tech. Yep. You seem to me to be extremely technically savvy. Besides seeing that the photos are coming through, that they're tethering OK, what else is the digital tech doing for you? All right, so the question is, what is a digital tech doing for me because I'm a camera nerd already and don't necessarily need the technical stuff? Um, so primarily what a digital tech is doing for me, so I'm going to bring up this in case anybody wants the, um, primarily what a digital tech is doing for me is making sure everything's coming in, that nothing went wrong like that I didn't bump the exposure or that all the lights are firing, all that stuff, and then helping the client while they select. So in some situations, I think you'd asked this before, if the client is on set and watching, they might say, I like that one. The digital tech gives it a, a star. So that kind of thing, maybe processing low res. But I, I assisted a lot of years. Um, and so the technical stuff, I don't necessarily need help for technical stuff. I don't need somebody's help for lighting. I don't need stuff. But I do need somebody to move things around so I can focus on other things. And when I was assisting, I worked for a lot of people that didn't know how to light. And they would say, here's the layout. What should I rent? And how do we light it? But that's, that's not what I look for. I just look for someone who can monitor everything, make sure everything's happening correctly, and make sure that the client is happy and can see what they need. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess it sounds to me that they're almost doing what a regular assistant is doing. It doesn't seem so sophisticated that you need. It, it's not. A digital tech. It's not. But in honesty, too, I remember from when I was assisting and I felt like photographers, the photographers that treated me well, I appreciate it. So if I have the budget, I will hire somebody as a tech, even though what I'm looking for is not what the super experienced techs are necessarily going to do. I'm going to hire them as a tech, and I'm going to pay them as a tech because they're on the computer. Sometimes I don't have the budget for that, and my assistant is also monitoring the computer, and I'll pay them for that, too, you know, and then they're getting paid as an assistant. But if I can, I want to pay everybody as much as I can all the time. Well, it's... You know, everybody's working hard, and they appreciate it. And honestly, too, then if I have a shoot where I don't have much of a budget, they're more likely to, to be flexible with me. Take care of your team. Always take care of your team. Any, any other questions? Yes? You're on social media a lot and things like that. For social media, uh, when you're posting or doing a video or something like that, sometimes you have to detune your pictures, your videos, and stuff like that. What do you use to, to do that? And do you draw a line somewhere where social media says, like Twitter maybe says, <laughs> too big a file? Like 
so the question is, what do I do on social media when the files have to be adjusted? Yeah. Um, it depends on the situation. I have things that I've just not posted because I wasn't happy with how it was going to look. Uh, in general, though, you, you're just resing stuff down, and it's fine. Um, sRGB, not RGB 98, because they all, and everything compresses stuff, so you want to put a good quality file. Like if you're going to put it on Instagram, upload a good quality file to start with, because Instagram is going to compress it. Facebook is going to compress it. They're all going to compress it. So you don't want to start with something that's already too compressed, because then it's a compression of a compression, and it starts getting weird. And then, like I said, sometimes I'll upload something, look at it, and say, nope, delete it. You really just have to do the same thing. You just have to look at it. Yep. It's, if it's crap, to say we can't do it. Yep. Okay. Or I'll start over and see if I can, like, wow, the colors sure got washed out. Then I'll saturate it a little and then re-upload it. Okay. Yes? Thanks. Do you find uh, some of your clients like demand a certain level of, of camera, like a medium format versus uh, Full you know, that's an interesting. Th that's an interesting question. The question is, do clients care about the camera and want a certain level? I remember when the Sony mirrorless came out. I knew people that were like, I could never shoot with that because it doesn't look big enough. I, in my experience, have never had a client have any opinion whatsoever, except when they're curious, like, oh, what are you shooting with? I've never had anybody. No, that's not true. I had somebody once who had certain resolution specs. They're like, can you make sure it's this amount of resolution? And the specs were so low that it must have been based on like 15 years ago. <laughs> they didn't know what they were talking about. No. That, when people give you specs, it's usually because they don't know. And they got burned because they didn't know. So somebody said, make sure it's this. And they just do that. But I mean, 42 megapixels is plenty. 24, the A9 is 24, that's plenty for almost anything. I just like having more resolution. Right. Um, I, yeah, I've never really had anybody say it must be this camera. Depends on the usage, too. Yeah. If it's a cover, you know, and, and the detail. Yeah, the, the quality of the image or the size of the, the amount of resolution, it does depend on how the picture will be used. So his point is if it's a cover, it, you know, you don't want to shoot it on a, I don't know, a three megapixel camera from 20 years ago. Um, yeah, on a 1D or a, or the D30. Um, but there is a magazine I shoot covers for, and they actually ask me for pictures that are 12 inches high at 300 PPI, which is much lower than this, because they're they print it a little bit less than that, and that's they don't want a bigger size. But it starts out with this. And they keep having me shoot more, so they must be happy. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody.